Today on Quest, television actress Liz Kiefer. Life is a quest for logic and reason. It is a quest to find balance between science and faith. Life is a quest for knowledge and understanding. But most importantly, it's a quest for personal discovery. Whatever your quest, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Welcome to Quest. Hello everyone, I'm your host, Todd Fisher, and this is Quest. For those of you that might be new listeners, let me tell you a little about me. I'm the founder of Metatomics and the author of the best-selling book, Metatomics, The Grand Design. I'm a philosopher, a theorist, a metaphysicist. I'm a perpetual pupil of theology, and I'm an expert in comparative religious study. I've also extensively researched the mind-body connection, anatomy, and physiology. I documented over 300 case studies while researching my book, all from a scientific perspective with cases that range from near-death and out-of-body experiences to possession to past life experiences, as well as the metaphysical, the paranormal, and other unexplained cases of a spiritual nature. This podcast will bring you some of those astonishing stories, and in some cases by the people that actually lived them. From time to time, I'll be talking about important, perhaps even controversial issues from both spiritual and scientific points of view. The world we live in is ever-changing, and there's often a conflict between spirituality and science, and I wanted to bring you this podcast to balance that equation. It will show you how we know what we know, and there's still so much we don't know. For me, curiosity is part of what makes us human. It's the joy of discovery. It's what drives us. It's our quest. Today's interview is with Liz Kiefer. Liz is a veteran of both daytime and primetime television. This podcast was recorded earlier this year, back when people could record face-to-face, which is why the quality is so good. Hopefully we'll be back to those days soon enough. I hope you enjoy today's quest. So today I'm with Liz Kiefer, who most of you may know from The Guiding Light she played Blake Thorpe. For how many years did you play Blake Thorpe? 17. 17. So welcome to the show, Liz. Thank you. I had many last names on that show. Blake, Thorpe, Marler. Isn't there something else? Wasn't I married to one of the um, um, Spalding? I think so. You, uh, I, think I think so. I think I was married I think to, so. I, but, but it was another incarnation of Blake at that point. Right, right. <laughs> yes, yes. And did, did you, you, you replace someone? I replaced Sherry Stringfield. Okay. Yeah. Right, right. She was amazing. She was on the show for three years. And prior to that, Elizabeth Dennehy. Wow. Of, of Brian Dennehy's daughter. Yeah. Um, brilliant. All of them brilliant. I mean, those were some class acts. You were the most popular follow. Blake, though, I think. Oh, well, aren't you? I was the longest. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I saw somebody posted something on um, social media the other day. They were doing one of those. Which Blake did you like better? <laughs> Just my biggest nightmare, right? I wake up to that. But somebody said something lovely. And it's like, Sherry was the Blake you love to hate. And I was the Blake you just wanted to love. And I, I think that that's very true. Because my Blake was um, not as edgy, but it had so much more vulnerability and evolved in, into the, a full human being instead of just a, you know. Right, right, right. Bad girl. Yeah, I was, you know, little known fact about Todd, but I did watch The Guiding Light starting in middle school. <gasps> and I got um, I got kind of hooked into it. You know, it was one of those things that was always on when I I got off the bus and went yeah. home. But it was always at like three thirty or something. Mm-hmm. It was always like halfway through the show. I always caught the second half of the show. It was always frustrating for me. Um, so in the mid 80s, I got hooked on Guiding Light, which I watched for a long time. Well, that makes you a very smart person. It does, yeah. <laughs> I've always it's... said that Guiding Light fans are 
just the they have the best taste they're they're very intelligent but honestly i have to say i started watching it in 1979 wow so i was a big fan of the show for so years so i watched I you know you, your predecessor and yes. then i got you as i watched into the 90s um but i think i remember my grandparents would have on like um all my children and things like Ryan's hope and things like that. And those would always be on the background. Although I never really paid much attention to them. They were just always, always on. Um, and then I remember there was this little time frame where I liked, uh, the the days of our lives. Mm -hmm. Um, especially when they implemented some like really corny stories. I was like, there's a a vampire in the show. I'm totally going to watch this, you know, whatever it was, you know, I can't remember if someone was possessed. That's what, maybe that's what it was. It was a possession. It was a possession. Yeah. And I'm like, Hey, this is great. (laughs) Why wasn't I watching this all the time? Uh, but yeah, so soaps are an interesting thing, but you know, what we're going to do is we'll go back way before you did that. So, um, you know, you, I want to touch on this because I, I like eighties television and you know how big of a fan I am of some of these shows that you, are. you were in, I'm you know, so impressed. Um, but let's go back even before that. So tell me, where did you grow up? Where did you tell me about your schooling and how you got into the, into wanting to be an actress? Let's go over that. Well, I grew up in California, um, Southern California, uh, born in Santa Monica, actually. So, I have to say, I didn't have to travel far. It was right in my backyard. Um, and I really just did the regular. My sister was very involved in theater, and she was six years older than me and always pulled me in from the time I was five years old on to be the kid in the Christmas pageant. And you know, I was always being volunteered for something. And so I, I have to say, I was... I, I rather liked being on stage. It was, it was fun. It was fun. And um, I loved being involved with whatever she was involved with. And I used to look up to the high school productions. And as a kid, I would go see everything and have crushes on on all the leading men. <laughs> <You know? laughs> when I was in fourth grade, that was a big deal. Um, <coughs> and uh, and then I, I guess I got into it um, through singing. Um, I was always a singer first, and I'd be involved in all the magical groups and all the singing groups, which led to getting into musicals, and I just loved it. Um, It was where I became alive, and it was where I was able to express myself fully. Um, I I, I have to say I I came from a household that was, um, my father was, uh, uh, I'm going to say overprotective. (laughs) and uh, strict and um, and he was very sick for most of my life and there was this uh, feeling of oh I need to be a good girl and follow the rules not upset the boat and so that shaped a a lot of my um, development where I just wasn't allowed to show the dark sides of me or the wild sides of me or whatever. It's like, uh, put that on hold for now. Let's not upset the apple cart. Apple cart. But then I could get into theater and I was allowed to be all this stuff and it was okay. I mean, I was doing a part and I could tap into all those different parts of, of my personality. And um, I think that's why I loved it so much. And did you did you do anything as a child actress? Did you get commercials or involved in any TV or film then? Um, no, I think the closest thing I I did when I was fifteen, I was part of a, a group called the Young Americans, which was great. We t- traveled around California for me. I didn't I didn't go much further. I didn't go across country, but I remember doing a show with Bob Hope and all that kind of thing, and that was a little semi professional song and dance group I used to go I used to be the youngest and smallest and I would be uh, in the middle singing I've got a little guiding light (laughs) hello wow what a (laughs) that used to be my number Wow. but anyway that's when I was 15 I did start when I was 18 I that's when I started um, doing commercials and getting into television and all, all of all of that. I, I I did have an agent for a while when I was sixteen, but it was it was a tough one when I was in high school. It was a tough because at that point, 
um, they want you to be uh, over 18 to play a 15 year old. Sure, sure. And and so. Where did you go to college? Was it USC? Did you go there? No, I was at UCLA. UCLA, okay. And then I went to, um, it's, it's called the Academy of Stage and Cinema Arts. Um, where I studied with David Alexander, who is no longer with us, but, and neither is this particular school. It was really quite wonderful at the time. It was the only professional school in, in, in Los Angeles that combined stage and film. So I, I, I was there for about four years while I was on Young and the Restless and um, trying to learn learn as I go because I was at UCLA I was in the music department I see I see and what was your first big television break outside of a soap was it happy days happy days was one of the first that was the second job I ever did the first one was Lou Grant right Lou Grant right right Lou Grant where I played I was the lead of a movie that he was watching and it was very controversial because it was all about the effects of how uh, uh, violence can affect, watching violence can affect kids. And um, I was a girl that was, uh, had a boyfriend that was in a, or in a, in a gang and they had just beat him up. The gang members had beat him up and raped me. Wow. And I had to drag this boyfriend into a car and get into the car and go run go after the gang members who are off on motorcycles and run them over and and that's and intense was, for Lou Grant episode so <laughs> intense that because it had to be a very controversial wow movie that they were watching and um so I was a movie within a movie because I never got to work with Ed Asner <coughs> he just was they would have shots yeah. of of, of the footage that I filmed and, and, and them watching it being mortified, you know, right? Um, yeah, that was, that was quite a first, first show. So I'm going to run the list of all the cool stuff you did that I happen to be fans of all these things. So you were in Happy Days, yes. Cheers, The Facts of Life, Full House, 21 Jump Street, My Two Dads, Charles in Charge, Married with Children, Superboy, Freddy's Nightmares, which some people won't remember Freddy's Nightmares. I was a big fan of the show. Oh, my gosh. I did. Yeah. I did some big ones on that one. Yeah. That was a lot of. But uh, and then we'll get into some some things after that. But like this was me growing up on TV, the big nerd that I was. I was consumed with television. I love television and I tuned into all of these things. So let's start with Happy Days. Happy Days. You're Happy in days. Substitute Fonzie, which is one right. of my favorite episodes. I love it. What are your do you, What do you remember from the show? I mean, uh, obviously coming in, like in any kind of guest starring role, there's already a family that's there that's already happening. They but. were so wonderful. It what? was so wonderful. Um, but Henry Winkler, of course, is my, my, my the biggest impression, my fondest memory, um, because my scenes were with him. He, where he was teaching, right. substitute right. teaching for sex or health health class, and I asked, raised my hand and asked if he could explain how you got pregnant. And, <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> um, and which then he does, and he and then they're going to fire him, and then you know all this. I, then I sit, come to him and thank him because my mother told me you could get pregnant by kissing a boy while wearing a bathing suit, and uh -huh. I was thought I was pregnant and thank you for explaining this to me and now I can relax. But I had like three or four scenes with him and um, he just, um, he was just magnificent and generous and um, I was very self-conscious. I was, I think I was 18, I was very self-conscious and I was um, very much aware of what I was doing and when I was going to make my entrances and how I was going to say my lines. And um, I think he saw that and went, hmm. And he used to do something, um, I just remember this, waiting to go on into the scene of Arnold's. There was one, one, one scene where I have to go to Arnold's. I, I walk into Arnold's and he makes an entrance after me. And I'm waiting for my cue to go on and he's backstage or, you know, right outside of camera 
completely distracting me, just won't stop talking to me, won't stop. To me, it was so irritating at the time. It's like, I am trying to listen to my cue. What are you doing, you know? (laughs) And what I realized later was he was just keeping me present. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Which I found, I, I realized later, oh, yeah, that's what he was doing. He was, he was making sure that I just didn't get too um, in my head. And I was so, uh, uh, um, what's the word? I was so engaged in trying to get him to stop talking to me. <laughs> That by the time they did cue me, he practically had to, th- you know, push me on onto the set, and then I was a hundred percent present. Wow, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Now, was that show did did it have a laugh track or was it taped with a studio audience? Do you remember? Um, that was taped with a studio audience. Yeah. What was that like performing in front of people? You had some theater, so was it? Was it, it was great. It's similar just to like that? doing theater, yeah. um, especially with the three cameras, because um, I really loved it. I love every single um, show that I did in the 80s, the, all of them, Cheers, they all had three camera um, uh, setup. So you just have to um, make sure that you're positioned correctly for the cameras, but really they find you. So it's like doing theater and allowing cameras to to, um, film you. Did you work with Ron Howard later on? No. You didn't, okay. I couldn't remember if you did or not. Well. What your relationship was with Ron Howard. I have a a relationship with Ron Howard in my head. But that's that's another story. (laughs) That's, I, I feel like I know Ron. I actually did audition for him. I did meet him when I did the Happy Days. He wasn't on the episode of Happy Days because uh, that was the last season of Happy Days. He was off it by then. Yeah. But then I went in and I had a meeting with him for a pilot that he was um, shooting called Skyward. And um, he was very lovely. Although he didn't, he didn't come back till the end, right? At the wedding. Yeah. Like he was gone that whole season. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he, I think he came back for Joni's wedding. Yeah. And that was like a big surprise. Yeah. And he had that obnoxious mustache, I think, in the in the episode. He looked totally <laughs> different. How <laughs> dare he? <laughs> How dare he grow up? The last season was kind of rough to watch, but I do like Substitute Fonzie. It's one of my favorite episodes. And Ted McGinley. Yeah. 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 yeah and who is kind of like got this odd reputation of if Ted McGinley shows up on your show, you're in your last season Get of your show. <laughs> <laughs> He's the kiss of death for your show if he comes on. It's terrible. <laughs> was the nicest guy he did love boat and all that too yeah. same way he would come on and he's great to watch but like it was always like the tail end of the of the show what was cheers like what was the, do you, what do you remember from that just set? fantastic um that was so much fun i do remember auditioning for it and it was this it was this part in the prologue and it was a little tricky because i literally had to be asking woody harrelson you know the character of woody he plays yeah. woody, out on a date I ask him out so how do they go about a I was not even 21 so what was I doing in the bar in the first place that's that's just another we'll, we'll put that one aside for a second but how do you how do you pull that off you know I'm supposed to be the girl that you would love to bring home to mom and dad and 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 here I am asking him out for coffee but and he he runs away from like a he just can't handle it and so it's I'm the catalyst for his story but I remember at the audition and the callback for this and they're all all the powers that be are in the room and and they were saying okay they mentioned that it may not be a role that actually gets into the final um, uh, script it, it's possible that it could get cut and I remember just in the auditioning telling them, oh, please don't cut this. I really, I'll be a hat rack. I will be anything on this show that you want. <laughs> I said that to them. But anyway, it was lovely, fabulous. The Norm character. Yep. What's, what's, what's his, what's the actor's name? Um, oh, gosh. You know, it'll come to me in a minute. Yeah, it will. Yeah. It'll come. Yep. He was the sweetest, most 
he, I sat next to him a lot on the, at the bar when we were with rehearsing. Um, he was so lovely. George I, I, Went? Right. Yeah, yeah, George yeah, Went. yeah. George, yeah. Um, they were all lovely. I, I remember Ted Danson brought in a masseuse the day of the shooting. You know, when you, you rehearse all week long. Right. Which is, I love that. That's like theater. That's, you just get to rehearse in stages all week long, and eventually they add the cameras, and then you do dress rehearsal, and then you shoot it before a live audience twice. You have an afternoon show, show and an evening performance, and um, you get notes in between. And uh, I remember Ted, Ted Danson um, h hired a masseuse for anybody, anybody's use, the day of, of the of the filming and I I, I, I was that was I was beyond <laughs> could uh, ecstatic could, static. could cheers come back in this in this world we're in today of shows being rebooted and brought back wouldn't that be nice? couldn't cheers could cheers come back why not could Sam Malone exist in the world today in our 21st century me too era or would, oh, I would love to see it actually yeah. oh I'd love to see a show I'd love to see him come back and then have all the girls have to come back and he's got an answer to it. Wouldn't that be fun? That would be interesting. I would like that. There's always, you always hear rumblings about something with Cheers. You know, Cheers is one of those rare shows that's like Friends or Seinfeld. There's a handful of shows, The Office, that people just continue to tune into. Yeah. And that's why those shows are so valuable, especially today with this way we have all these streaming platforms that are happening. And... Uh, you know, the other just as as we record this, it was just announced that the Friends cast would get back together and do a reunion special mm -hmm. to kick off the new Warner Brothers streaming service that will oh, come wow. out in May. That's gonna and they're all getting like ten million dollars well. a piece, some insane amount of money to just talk, basically do a retrospective of the show and talk about it. Not even a new episode, not even that, wow. but just to talk. And that may be the only reunion we ever get with that show. Um, but people continue to tune into that because it, these shows make people happy. They make them you, happy. They f you, you feel safe. One of the one of the things that I, I find interesting about it <clears throat> is the way those shows were all made. All the ones I just mentioned, the way they were made, you could come back to them on the next Thursday or the next Friday, and you felt at home again. You couldn't wait to see your friends from TV again. But watching these things back to back. Today, the way people consume media mm -hmm. now, sometimes these characters are just really rotten. And you watch Friends and you're like, gosh, they're all kind of terrible to each other when you when you binge watch yeah. is the thing. Um, and, and Seinfeld knew that. And that's why they ended the show the way they did with basically putting the main characters on trial. And these are spoilers for anyone who's not watched or heard about the last episodes of Seinfeld but they are they're on trial for all the terrible things they did to people you know and all the <laughs> so people brilliant. from all the past shows come back and talk about how awful they were and then you realize wow they really were awful people but you didn't know that when you came back every Thursday night or every Friday night to watch to watch these people but today the way people consume material it's uh you see it you see that so shows are written differently now yeah so that you don't get tired of the characters so quickly you don't or you don't not like them so quickly but one thing i will say about cheers is that even binge watching those episodes now i never felt that way about those characters they played tricks on each other they pranked each other but they i never felt those characters were really rotten to people and uh, right. and that's what i like about it is that even binge watching the show still is very solid in terms of how it was written that you never really not liked people and even watching like Sam dating a different person all the time, like was like it's, it's like still it still works in a way, um, and it's it's fascinating. But Cheers, one of my favorite shows. It was uh, that was the bar I would love to plug into. You know, if yeah. I was if that was real and I could be in that town and go to that bar, uh, let's see, it had that feeling. You just wanted to come back to it. Every I remember week. shooting it too, uh, especially on the lot at Paramount. It was, I I just can't tell you how wonderful the eighties were going to Paramount and doing any of those shows. They were all families. You'd go to the commissary and I remember seeing Michael J. Fox at the commissaries and he's shooting, you know, yeah. his show over there and, and, and it was a big family. You did Facts of Life, which was a great show. Facts 20 of George Clooney. Yeah. 
<laughs> people forget George. Clooney was there, you know. But it's uh, well, that was a great show. I grew up watching that and uh, Twenty One Jump Street. And, people, oh, Twenty One Jump Street, and and uh, yeah, Johnny Depp came out Johnny of that. Depp. Like that was great. Wow. Early early Fox stuff was like so good to okay, watch. I played everybody's girlfriend. I just <laughs> made a living going from one show to another playing the girlfriend or the old girlfriend. Were you Johnny Depp's girlfriend? In I was. Jump? I was yeah. his ex-girlfriend that was getting married. And uh, he, and, and I remember in Las, Ve Las Vegas, and he travels with his old friend, like old college buddy or whatever, to try to, try to stop the wedding. Wow. Yeah. Would well, you have memories of Johnny Depp? Oh, Johnny Depp was great. Um, I, I He's elusive, you know. Uh -huh. um, I remember having just a terrible crush on him. <laughs> I can tell you that. I'm like, well, who wouldn't? I mean, he's just very charismatic. <laughs> and um, he was a lot of fun to work with. He's very, um, um, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. He's, he, 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 he ensnares you. Yeah. Like, I really got caught up in, like, ah, oh, I'm a little tongue-tied around him. Could, could you tell, when you worked on Cheers and you were around Woody Harrelson or you were around Johnny Depp, could you tell these people were going to be big stars, huge stars? Like, did, can you get that feeling as a young actress or young actor that you're next to someone who's like, wow, this person is going to go on to be something? Or is it just a peer that day? Do you, do you recall what no, that was like? No, I really felt that with Johnny Depp big time. I knew that there was something going on there with him. And um, Woody Harrelson, I'm telling you, I, he just kept, I, yeah, I probably, I probably did. Um, although he, he's just somebody, I was so naive. I really was so naive. And, you know, he comes in and he was just a prankster. And he would, he made me believe that, well, it's just, it's just a silly story. I don't even know how to explain it. But, you know, he's, he was so well, he was, his physique was like he was so well built and, and obviously worked out like crazy. He had me convinced that he never went to the gym and that this <laughs> never, ever, ever. And it would be silly conversations that, where I would actually believe it. Wow. That's the thing. I, I was very gullible. And when I was in my teens and my early 20s, I'd go on these sets and I'd, these guys were, that's funny. We're so wonderful. But, um, and even George Clooney, he was so charismatic. He was so charismatic. I was not surprised that, that he um, found his way. And what I always loved about George was that he was always very honest about himself. Very, very real and very honest. He never believed that he was this huge actor, Marlon Brando, that was going to go change the acting world. But right. he, but he knew he, he had charisma and he knew what to do with it and i think he was really smart and i think he he did grow into an amazing actor with huge chops so um i i always i'm a big uh, fan of him. er and i watch watch a lot of old er episodes a lot and I think he single-handedly developed the whole chin down, eyes up style yeah. of acting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> his brooding look from that show, which actually was just his trick for people that don't know that he would he couldn't remember his lines, so he would have it written on paper, and that's why he had his head tilted. Down, <laughs> down. Yeah. That sounds like George. Yeah. You know, it was weird with Johnny Depp. He didn't want to be the guy on the poster. You know, he, like uh, girls had posters of him all over their walls during Twenty One Jump Street, and he's like, I don't want to be that guy. Like, I don't want him. And he. He left all that. Yeah. He left Twenty One Jump Street, and uh, and started to do things like Edward Scissorhands and like these odd Tim Burton projects, and like go a different direction. It's always interesting to me uh, to see actors that are, that are like that that just want to throw away. I don't want to be the pretty boy actor in things. I want to try these crazy characters, right? And uh, the risk that that is. You see that with a lot of people, and uh, and it paid, it paid off for him big time. Yeah. 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 So you did uh, Married with Children. Oh, God. How fun was that? That was fun. That was so much fun. Um, that was, there was a great story on that one. Um, as I said before, you do, uh, the, at the end of the week, you do two performances, yeah. one in the afternoon and one at night. And they, 
decided to rewrite one of the scenes with Peg Bundy um, between episodes. They just decided it wasn't working. And they gave us a brand new scene. And maybe a half hour before we were going to go shoot it for the second, the evening performance. And I'm in a chair getting my hair done. And she's literally, she thinks I'm having an affair with Al, um, which I'm not, but she thinks I am. And she's cutting my hair. And, she, and I'm wearing this blonde wig. And she literally cuts my hair off. Um, but I'm sitting there reading a magazine, flipping through it. And what the audience doesn't know is that it's the brand new script taped inside the magazine. <laughs> and my hand is scrolling down and because she, she's literally reading off the script over my shoulder. And I'm trying to sh I'm following the lines with my finger. So, so she, she knows where she's supposed to be. And we're reading from the script. Wow. Wow. And they used it. That's great. That's great. Talk about a cold reading. What did you, did you like that set? I, I loved it. They were so real and down to earth, every single one of them. And, and I found it, um, well, of course they would be. In order to play that kind of farce and to do it so well, um, you, you all had to be really um, grounded actors. Right. Also with a studio audience. So with they, a studio yeah. audience. Interesting to do that. What about Charles in Charge? What do you What do you remember about Charles, Charles in Charge? In Charge. Um, I, I that one was a kind of a blur. <laughs> what was What was Scott Bayo like? Scott Scott was um, he was okay. He was okay. He was um, uh, and into his own. He he didn't. He kind of had his own world going. Um, so I didn't have a, I did have scenes with him, but I was supposed to be the babysitter that took over um, when he was gone or something. I can't remember. Yeah. And like, he was afraid that they were going to like me better. And he was, I, I can't even remember it all <laughs> that well. I think at that time I was a smoker and I was quitting smoking <laughs> and, and, and I was a little fuzzy <laughs> that week. <laughs> That's great. So, Superboy. Superboy. So, you are technically in the wikis of yeah, this I'm, world, I'm the, the superhero fairy. world. Yeah. So, so I had met uh, Gerard Christopher a long time ago, mm -hmm. who was technically the second Superboy yes. in that show. There was someone who was on the first season, and then Gerard came in mm -hmm. and, uh, and did it lovely. after that. Were you on Gerard's seasons for that? Or do you remember? What, where were you at? Yes, what? I believe. Okay. So you were a supervillain in this. I was the Yellow Perry. Yeah. Yeah. That was so much fun. Yeah. With all my little spells. And I got to play the double role of being the, um, the, the, the girl that's the nerd, the, just the, the total introverted, um, unpopular, unattractive nerd and then being transformed into the Yellow Perry and becoming, you know, I dream of Jeannie, basically. Um, but that was a lot of fun. I loved casting the spells, and um, the set was fantastic. And I had that little puppet who was so creepy. <laughs> yeah. You could go and do conventions just I suppose for I that. could. He does, you know. Gerard does. He goes out I and suppose doesn't. I could. Yellow Perry was fun. It was fun being evil. I've, I, I've had a couple of evil things. I, I was that way for Freddy's Nightmare, too. I, I don't think that uh, that DC has brought that. I'll probably, someone will probably write in and tell me, but uh, I don't think DC has brought that character back to do anything in any of the current incarnations of these shows. I could be Yellow Perry's mother. Would be would be interesting, because that's what they're <laughs> doing today. In kind of yeah. the new Arrowverse, yeah. there is a whole lot of stuff like that. You, yeah. see, you see that a lot. Yeah. You know, back then, uh, you know, growing up with like uh, the Incredible Hulk and Wonder Woman and these different shows and this earlier versions of, you know, uh, young Clark Kent type stuff. It, it, I had never thought that I would see a day when the superhero movies would be done like they are now. Hmm. Like it's an incredible what's what's become of this. Yeah. The DC movies, not so great. DC television, really great. Mm -hmm. um, but but Marvel has just change the game of how yeah. superhero movies can be done. It's like really amazing. Comic book fans, I think, are probably just, this was what they've been waiting for. 
This oh, might be the peak. <laughs> it, it, it is. It's yeah, it is. It's true. Would you uh, would you get involved with Marvel or DC today if you could? Sure. Yeah. I hadn't even thought about that. But now that you're bringing it up, it's like, wow, that's really great. I'm going to put that out into the universe. There's a whole lot, especially Let's have Yellow Perry come back. I uh, I watch a lot of the the DC TV stuff. I like I like Arrow and I like uh, the Flash. I like these shows, and it's really interesting because they 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 go with these ideas of there's you know there's other worlds out there. There's yeah. another type of Earth, and the Supergirl television show was on a different Earth than the mm-hmm. Earth that you know. So there's all these different versions of people, like the Flash television show that was around in the '90s. With John Wesley Ship, John Wesley Ship, oh, he is, was on Guiding Light. Yeah, yeah, he was, and uh, and you know his character that he played as the Flash in the '90s is in the new Flash TV show, mm. where he also plays the Flash's father in the you know. So okay. he like plays all these multiple roles in it, including oh, like a classic character from his show that they bring back with the costume and everything, just right, like exactly the same because there's all these alternate worlds, so they're able to bring back all these actors and all these people that played characters from from the old days and it's really neat to see that again and this nostalgia is really really pretty amazing so reach out if anyone out there from dc is listening yes. liz is available to reprise her role yeah yo perry <laughs> that's that sounds like fun i really did i had a lot of fun i remember flying out there too this is a <clears throat> little side story i flew out to florida to shoot that sitting next to betty white wow While she was going out to shoot Golden Girls, Ugh, I was and I was so nervous, and I, I had my little script for Yellow Perry, <laughs> reading my little script. She was so lovely. I didn't realize that that Golden Girls was actually really shot in Florida. Well, I'm assuming she went to Florida. She was going to Florida. Maybe I was in my own little Golden Girls world, thinking, of course, she's wow. going to Florida to shoot it. But she was going to Florida. But but Superboy was shot in Florida. I didn't. That I didn't was know shot that. in Florida. I did not know that. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. What's what studio was going on down there then? That I can't you, tell you. Was it in Orlando? Remember. Were you doing it yes. in Orlando? Yes. Okay. Yes. Huh. That's interesting. So Freddy's Nightmares. I was a big fan of Freddy's Nightmares. Ooh. Like a lot of people didn't realize that like both Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the Thirteenth had a little departure in the TV shows for a little while. Yeah. So I did a two parter on that. I think. Yeah, so Freddy's Nightmares was kind of cool, but that was like was like Freddy hosting like yeah. a night. It was like a Twilight Zone in a way, yeah. like Freddy telling a Twilight. And each each episode had its own story with its yeah. own set of characters. And I think I was a a novelist. I was a writer who was who um, was plotting to kill my husband, yeah. and I did it through the story I was writing. So whatever I wrote was really happening in real life, and so I think I poisoned him or something. That's I, great. I just remember them. I remember the the uh, audition the breakdown had a um, um, Michelle. They said a Michelle Pfeiffer type. <laughs> and I went, well, all right, I'll go for it. I was like, okay. Later on, you moved into some Law and Order TV shows. Oh yeah. You did right. SVU and you did Criminal Intent. Intent, right? Criminal Completely Intent. Completely opposite. Again, I do the flip thing. I go from. The girl next door to the glam vixen. So I, uh, criminal, criminal intent, I played a librarian whose husband was, so I was the victim in that one, whose husband was cheating on me and having an affair, and then having an affair with his publicist and, and she was killing people and I, I don't something something crazy um but I just remember that was with Vincent D'Onofrio having scenes with him that was he was lovely and um and then SVU I played the Fifth Avenue high-end um evil mother of the boy that's I, I guess charged his his high school teacher with rape, and wow. in reality, it was uh, the other way around. Or I don't know. I, I was evil. I See, was evil. I did, my son was evil. I have to say, I haven't. I don't watch Law and Order. It's not one of the shows I got into. Like, so I have no so many people that have done it, and then they made all these spinoffs. I know, but do you know what's interesting about the SVU one? It was so. Um, uh, I'm gonna say dark and and um, violent. 
I could not bring myself to watch the entire show. Wow. Or read the entire script. I literally, I'm just going to read the scenes that pertain to my storyline and that I need to know in order to tell this story. But I'm very protective of my consciousness now. I really am about what I, the images I, I uh, subject myself to and what stay with me. I just, I, I just, um, I don't want to, I don't want to have to linger on on imagery or ideas and that will bring me spiraling yeah. into a really negative pit. Yeah. And um, so I don't watch any of these criminal shows. So it was really difficult to actually do. When that came on, I was like watching NYPD Blue and I just couldn't like find the time to like do all these. So yeah. some, some people were Law & Order fans, some were kind of into CSI when that came out. Yeah. There were a whole bunch of these, but you just couldn't, there was no time to watch them all, you know? Yeah. And they have a life and work and do all that stuff. But I've always wanted to get into Law & Order, but like I just haven't been able to ever make the time to even watch it streaming, you know? Yeah. But uh, it was all great shows and much different than like all the sitcom work. So oh, so that's, a completely different. And it's shot more like a what, film. What I admire about your career is, number one, longevity in this business. To be able to yeah, continue to still be time. doing this today in, what, over 30 years? Over 30 nearing years. 40, from nearing 40 yeah, years, should I say? 30-something 30, 30 years. Yeah. 30, yeah. And <laughs> even recently you did Red Dead Redemption 2. So you did video yeah, game work. Yeah. You, you cover it all. I, yeah. That was a lot of fun. I played Miss Marjorie. Um, and that was like early 1900s, uh, kind of a Texas drawl. I, uh, uh, the, I, I was a, a circus manager and I had a little family of circus performers. I had the giant and the little like I had the, the little person and the giant and I called them my family. They called me mother. I was I was evil. I'm evil in that, too. Well, there's I'm even not very a, nice to them. There's even a clip. That's a popular game. That's a that really is. popular I'm a video side game. mission. Yeah, your side mission. But to be in a popular video game is like so cool. And my and, son was beside himself. And, he was in high school. His senior year in high school when I shot that. And, and I, I, he just couldn't believe it. And I didn't know what it was. I came home and I went gonna do this thing it's called what is it called red something and he's like what <laughs> <laughs> it was funny there's even a clip on youtube of just yeah. your character like there's yeah. this fans are rabid for that it's really really uh i a, love working with the the suit the whole the motion capture motion suit, caption yeah. suit with the they they hook you up and they monitor you and and it's all in front of a green screen so you don't everything's animated so there are no props i had to be doing a circus act with a yeah. whip and um remember every time i used that whip the the animators were saying you know you can't you have to use it sparingly you only use it very specifically because if you move your hand around we have to animate this whip no matter what it does yeah. so keep it behind you just let it drag behind you as you go that's what you'll be doing as yellow perry when you reprise the role you'll be in i'll be a motion capture suit on I a green will. screen and i do it well i have so much fun doing all the that. effects will be so much better <laughs> i loved it see i just love every new new thing that comes my way i love how you, it keeps evolving what you know for having a career this long in the business and as diversified as, as it is from soaps to sitcoms to procedural type dramas to video game work like you and you've done theater you've done significant amount of theater yeah, I love you've theater. done all this stuff what's the best advice you can give to someone entering the business now or as a female in the business or just generally how to have longevity in the business what what keeps people going because certainly there's enough actors that just they hang it up and they have to go home like what's is there a secret is there a secret sauce what would you say a secret sauce to that um, well, you know, I keep, um, finding the joy in it. I mean, I, to me, it's about following your heart. It really is just if it, whatever, go wherever brings you joy. And like people would get like, why t tell me, why are you doing all these musical comedies? You know, you should be doing the whatever. But my love of musical comedies is what sparked my 
love of doing sitcoms. I, 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 tra I transferred that into being able to have all that kind of energy. It's a different kind of energy. Um, so I guess my advice would be learn how to navigate the energy. I'm really good at that. I can dance with this. I can go to any single, any different um, modality and like film is more of a compressed. You just sit on, you sit on it like you're, you, 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 you um, I have a very good friend that used to say that um, theater is like having Thanksgiving dinner with your entire family and, and you have to deal with a huge table with a lot of people and film is having breakfast with your mother at the breakfast Interesting. table. Interesting. And so that to me, it's the same kind of fire that's underneath both but it's 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 film you compress it it's 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 compressed energy and you're sitting on whoa, whoa look at big, that wind big is, gust of wind coming through yeah the, right like now. what i'm saying right now <laughs> universe is going yeah so, so so i i have to say um don't be afraid of of going from stage to film everybody you know everybody has these opinions that oh you have to do one or the other or you you know you can't do it stage actors can't do film film people can't do stage it's like oh bananas um don't be afraid of it just learn how to navigate it and keep following it that's great advice great advice so you know with my with my podcast i like to you know i would like to get to know my guests um but i also like to bring up things that are a little more controversial a little trickier now, people that know me know I've had a history in film and television, and I've done this for a lot of my life, and uh, and I've moved out of it in recent years to move toward my, um, you know, my Metatomics project, and I put my book out, and, yeah. and 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 my life's changed in a lot of ways in terms of how I've gained my spirituality and, and what I, how I didn't f feel fulfilled in film and television, and that I have a different calling now, and. Uh, and there's certainly a dark side to this industry. And as we record this podcast today, we're just days away from Harvey Weinstein's verdict. He's mm -hmm. guilty. He's probably going to spend a lot of time in jail. Yeah. And uh, and certainly there's there's elements like that. Did you ever have experiences where you saw a dark side of the business, or would you do you, do you keep? Do you, do you, obviously, you're here today to talk to us, so you've navigated that. But yeah. did you see a seedy side of the business, or was it relatively just good to you? both <laughs> the answer is yes and yes um i i did see it um is it main, mainly in drugs or predatory behaviors what predatory you... behaviors um but i have to say I, I, i'm a tigress when it comes to that and i absolutely wouldn't enter it i wouldn't allow myself to even there was something within me, even as a young, even though I was naive and young and Woody Harrelson could convince me that he never went to the gym. <laughs> um, you couldn't convince me to um, step outside of my integrity. Yeah. That, that there was something within me that just wouldn't allow for that. So if it ever, I, I, I I don't like, I don't, you know, talk about stuff. I don't, I don't really believe in feeding all of that. But I did have a few instances that of predatory behavior of which I just um, absolutely said no. I just resisted and said no. Now, granted, nothing that ever stopped my career from advancing. Yeah. So I was never faced with that. I never lost a job because of that. Um, I might have lost contacts, but they weren't contacts that I wanted. So I guess I... Is it different, you know, maybe to define it, like it, 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 there's casting couch behavior. Yeah. And then there's like an actor on set that might hit on a guest star. Is, is, do you the, differentiate between the two or is it the same thing? Um, I didn't have any issues with the casting couch. That I've actually, casting people have been really wonderful. And quite frankly, most of them were women that were very lovely and generous. Um, people on people on set when I would guest star, I've I had a few instances mm -hmm. where it's just been um, assumed that I would. I see. 
um, go along with a particular behavior and, and, and be one of the girls. Though they always do this. All the this, guest stars do this. And I'm like, I don't think so. That type of activity will probably always be around in Hollywood, do you think? Or do you think it will add the practice of that will end eventually? Do you think Weinstein verdict changes how this is? Well, you know, I've I had an instant. Uh, this is going to be the difference, and I won't say what the show is or what the person was because sure, I just course, don't believe no, in doing that. No, don't. But but I did have an instance where somebody really had predatory behavior and had certain expectations of me while I was the guest on that show, and. Um, was pretty insistent and I felt the pressure and I was like no <laughs> I'm just doing my job and I'm going home and when the persistence kept coming I actually did say something to a producer wow it's like this is because they wanted to know what was wrong and because it could see something was happening and um when I said you know this is happening and I don't appreciate it they walked the other direction well, wow. they absolutely did not stand up for me and did not do anything about it. Just said, OK, I'm not touching this and walked away and let me deal with it on my own, which I did. Yeah. I, I'm hoping that that's what's changed and what will change and what will not be allowed to exist. Yeah. yeah. Because that was the closest I ever got to. Wow. No one's going to back me up here. Wow. wow. OK, I see. Um and I, and I think now you just can't get away with, um, with that happening and you getting away scot-free. Right, right. No, I, I totally agree with that. I do. It's, it's crazy to see how things are shifting. Yeah. I think uh, the, the studios, the production companies are taking more ownership in this and really locking in on this behavior. I, yeah. I, I think there's always going to be the the horny guy or girl that are going to, you know, be looking for someone to go out with on a particular night. Oh, Whether, sure. That's always going to happen, yeah. I think, among actors. But yeah. uh, but I think uh, th a lot of things are going to really be micromanaged from this, for well, sure. Yes. You see, I think I, when it took, t t when I went to that level, when the producers wouldn't, when they just walked away and were going to let me fry, basically. Yeah. Um, that, I, I think on that level, that's changed. I just don't think that they would allow for that. Something, it, and, and, the, and the, I'm hoping that a male predator who feels that they have that kind of power won't be allowed to have that kind of power. Right. That, that, can, it, that won't be able to exist. But a lot of it's the culture of the set. You know, you, can, you go in and you feel it on different shows. Yeah. You can really feel it. And... Um, I also am very spiritual in my way of going about what I'm asking for in my life. And I made very clear intentions of the kind of people that I wanted to work with. And I made a list of qualities of how I wanted to feel when I went on a set. And ever since I did that, that's what I've been getting. And I think, too, what you just said about there's a culture on a set, I think that's also kind of a branch of the corporate culture of the studio too. Yeah. I know a lot of people that sometimes felt at home more at Warner brothers than they did at Sony. And it's almost from the top level down mm -hmm. that there is a corporate culture of everything that's there, including all the shows and the showrunners and all that For stuff. For instance, so, when I talked about being on Paramount, how what a fam that was just a whole bunch of families. Yeah. Whatever was going on there with that, but with the happy days and the cheers and all of that, it's like, give me Paramount. I, yeah. I just, every time I walked onto that lot, I knew I was safe. I knew I was valued. I, and, 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 you, and you got that. In, and I think that still exists today, these, these corporate cultures and kind mm -hmm. of the way all that stuff is done, only on a much bigger level because there's like so many more networks now and so many more methods of del delivery for right. things. There's probably more opportunities now than there ever has been. Right. So you do, you have a, you have a website, LizKiefer.com, right? Or Liz, Liz Kiefer, Kiefer Acting? Well, I, I have so many. You have many. a whole bunch of websites. I, Tell I me think about. I, I need to condense them. Um, LizKiefer.com is my coaching website. Right, which I wanted to bring up. That's why. I, yeah. So tell me about that. So it, you're, it's, it's life coaching, right? It's life coaching. It's helping people with empowerment, self-empowerment, standing in your power. 
um, everything that I learned from surviving uh -huh. the, the acting world yeah. and industry, um, as well as I did a deep dive into a lot of training with um, life coaching. I worked with Dr. Martha Beck for many years and um, also Christy Whitman, who's really lovely. With, she, I did a lot of intense training with her with, with um, law of attraction and universal laws and what have you. Um, so I have my own little blend of how yeah. I um, just with how I, how, when Guiding Light, I, the end of Guiding Light was very um, tumultuous and especially the last five years because before the show actually went off the air, I was actually taken off contract. So I had this change of status of 12 years of this amazing contract where I, life was just crazy yeah. good, right? And then I was taken off contract but still remained on the show, but meant I had to live in this little world of uncertainty yeah. and and not... And, and I want everyone... So I, don't know, I, got to, I don't mean to cut you off, but I want everyone to hear this in your podcast. Oh, okay. So save some of this I'll because... Because you have a podcast that just came out called Let's All Feel Better. Let's All Feel Better. And this better. is like the first episode. This like is you the pour first all this episode. out. So I, don't spoil it here. I, okay. I Everyone won't. go listen to this okay, because yes. it's incredible. So, but, but what happened was yeah. when I left Guiding Light, I really did have a change of mission in life where it was no longer about getting the next acting role, of which I'm still auditioning and doing acting roles. Yeah. But it really became important to. Um, work with people. I started working with people acting wise, being an acting coach, but really what I was doing was life coaching because I was helping them stay in their center, stay in their power, know what they're feeling, what they're thinking, and and learning how to respond to the stories that they're telling themselves. So um, it really became important to start a business where I would help non-actors. Yeah. Learn all these tools that I learned as an actor. And um, I'm really good at that. I'm really good at helping non-actors learn how to get comfortable and, and find their power and find their center and, um, and creatively. Yeah. So, so I have a coaching business and now I have a podcast called Let's All Feel Better where I uh -huh. really go through all of this. I share a lot of tools and strategies. I'm five five episodes into the six that are out, or is that right? There's, fi There's five, five episodes. Out, so I'm on the are, final one that's out. Right oh now. my yeah. goodness, you're on the final one. Um, five are up, and then we'll be letting one every couple of weeks yeah. after this, and because I'm doing this with my my partner. And people can Parish. find that at Let's All Feel Better dot com. There's Let's a YouTube all feel page. Better dot com is our website. Right. Um, you we're on Apple. Let's All Feel Better podcast is, yep. is at Apple, Spotify. Um, we have a YouTube channel, Let's All Feel Better. Um, basically, anything you type in for Let's All Feel Better, you'll find um, the podcast. Yeah. Um, and, and then you can go to the website and, and um, speak to us if you want. Ask did, questions. I think I, I'm trying to remember if I, I'm remembering this correctly, but did you mention in the podcast about being pregnant on Guiding Light and they were covering you up or that what was I was yeah my first pregnancy in real life first Blake was pregnant and I wore a pillow for nine months which was hysterical <laughs> those twins by by two different fathers I wore a pillow for nine months and then as soon as Blake had her babies then Liz got pregnant and then they hit it and I had the big affair with Ben Warren so <laughs> that was hysterical and I had to hide behind big purses and sofas. Wow. See, and you've had two kids. Two kids. And you've continued working all oh, this time. I've been, I, I've been blessed as in the acting fairies just said, oh, we're going to give you a fabulous job where you don't even have to work five days a week <laughs> and you can be home at night and you can be pregnant and you get to wor be a working actor and you get to work with Jerry Verdorn and Maureen wow. Garrett and Maeve Kincaid and Michael Zaslow, wow. and, you know, and all these, you know, wonderful people. I mean, just, that, that cast was insanely talented um, and loving. And I can't say enough good things, you know, Kim Zimmer and, I, oh my gosh, the, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Yeah. yeah. I want to talk about, this is the last topic I really want to get into in the, in the show today, but I'm always interested in 
spirituality in the entertainment business because uh, there's a lot of it hidden. <laughs> there's a lot of people that don't wear their Catholicism on their sleeve mm -hmm. in Hollywood. Today, uh, there are a lot of young um, actors and hosts and different people that are coming out and being more about their, that they're Christians or that mm -hmm. they're Catholic or that they're Jewish or whatever they are. Yeah, do you remember, like, how am how important is that in the business to keep a spirituality or to be in an organized religion? And, and why do you think people don't talk about it more? Why don't you think it's a bigger part? It's a really good question, and I went through it myself. Um, not with an organized religion, but just even coming out with, I'm now going to work with people. And I work in with my coaching. It is it's very spiritual in nature because it's, 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 I'm a mystic, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I believe in all of that and the laws of the universe and law of attraction, but done intelligently, um, and creatively, you know, um, but I think it's important to have that. So you have something, you have your own source, you know, if you're just being, um, if your identity is based on the last show that you, the show that you're on, and if you're if you happen to be a working actor or not, you're going to be in trouble, because it, it, the, the the nature of the business is you're just a gypsy, and and it just you know everybody's right. only worried about uh, even when they're on a show, is it going to go off, and what's going to be my next show, and yeah. so so I think it's important to have something that's bigger than you and that you're a part of and you have purpose and you understand why you're in this business and how it's helping people. Yeah. Um, because that's how you stay. Um, and, and, and that's, that's how you, well, that's, that's the reason for purpose. It's you're al yeah. you align yourself with purpose. Yeah. I mean, when all that flows, wow, the success just comes easily. That's what I have found to be true. But it was interesting. I had such a strong, I have had a really strong spiritual life. And I was afraid to show that. Like, oh, now I'm going to be, I, they're not going to be able to see me as um, a bad girl or, a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm limiting myself mm -hmm. by identifying myself with this particular um, thought, you know, right. modality. Um, it, it's an interesting, it's really it's a good question. Why is there fear of yeah. being exposed? It, it seems like there's a lot of people in the Hollywood community that are searching for something as oh, evident yeah. by, you know, how like Church of Christian Science oh, and look Scientology, how Scientology and comes all in. kinds of, you know, people are reaching for anything they people can get. Are. People go to take yoga classes to get some level of spirituality and they go yeah. off to retreats and all these different things. And, um, but you know, but why, don't we hear it more? That's what I find interesting about the whole thing is. is yeah, and it, it's because there's, I know I was always, was given the message to keep your private life private. Don't let them, don't give them too much information. Mm -hmm. Keep yourself an enigma. So you'll be, you can, you can be a blank slate right. to people. Um, that's, what is that? I, I don't. I, I have found that the I've had more success by being genuine, human, honest, open, and vulnerable. And I've made a decision that I am not listening to those rules of old Hollywood anymore. <laughs> um, hence my podcast, where yeah. I, I think that's more magnetic and more engaging, and 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 it's it. it, it it's all about inclusivity and that's what acting does is is if you can see your humanity in somebody else yeah. and you you feel connected you can connect yeah. to people so i don't understand why we're giving the message of stay separate yeah <laughs> just it makes no sense that's a that's a good way to end in this on for sure liz i appreciate you coming on the show you're welcome and uh, imparting all this knowledge <laughs> on us and giving us a walkthrough of the history of you and the business, which is amazing. It was fun, and you know so much. I'm so I'm so impressed. And uh, and are you on social media? How can people find I you am, on social I'm, media? I am. I'm Instagram. I'm at the Liz Kiefer. Um, uh, Facebook. I'm at uh, Liz Kiefer Actor. And Twitter. I'm at Liz Kiefer. 
Plus, Let's All Feel Better has all its own, everything. At Let's All Feel Better is for Instagram. and Yeah, that's on everything. That's so on everything. Go listen to that podcast. But you can find me. I'm I'm. I'm there and find me. I'm ask me questions. It I'm is very happy. good. And and go to her website for life coaching if you need it. Yeah. This, this woman knows what she's talking about. I'm telling you. I know her. <laughs> but Liz, hey, thanks for coming on and we'll uh we'll have you back again and we'll have more more topics and more things to talk about. I would love to. We'll do it in 30 years when you have 30 years more work and to I'll talk be about. Yellow Perry's grandmother. You'll be you will be <laughs> Yellow Perry's grandmother. All right. I love it. Thanks. Bye-bye. There you have it. My interview with Liz Kiefer. We recorded this before COVID and before protests and riots. Back when Harvey Weinstein was the top news story. It seems like forever ago, but really it's only been a few months. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. There won't be one for Labor Day Monday, so I'll see you in two weeks on Quest. Thank you for listening to Quest. Please be sure and rate and review this podcast. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Be sure to visit the official website for the International Association of Metatomics at metatomics.org or find us on social media for other unique content. And make sure to pick up a copy of the book that started a spiritual revolution, Metatomics, The Grand Design, available for sale online and at most major bookstores. Thanks for listening.